I'm going to do a quick intro so see why I can see can run his magic edits in the robot. And then okay. uh, I'll just kick it over to you. Uh, first thing we usually do, like he said, like, just give us your full Air Force journey where what you're doing now and then start with where you're from, why you joined, all what your original AFSC was, um, any PCS moves or bases that you were at, uh, cool things that you liked, didn't like, whatever you want to chat about. And then, um, like he said, I'll specifically ask how you uh, were interested in or got tied into the innovation space initially in your career. And then how that, what you're doing with it, <clears throat> what, what you're doing with it now. And then from there, any, any organic stuff or anything you want to chat about, we, we have a full reign of time and space. Fantastic. Uh, well, nice to meet you. First off, uh, Michael Anthony Kona Kalani Moore is my whole name. Master Sergeant type. I am originally from uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. I joined the Air Force back in 2010. So August of 2010, uh, security forces. Okay. Security forces <laughs> was uh, number one on my list, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes, yes, not very many of me sometimes, but I, I joined. I joined back then. One while well, I was fresh out of high school, so finished high school back in 2010 May, and then was in the Air Force August 2010. So oh, I know it's a big deal here. Do you want to shout out your high school? Oh, uh, yes, uh, Damien yeah. Memorial High School is where I went. Nice. So it was a all boy Catholic school. Okay. Um, and I went there from uh, eighth grade, eighth grade to uh, obviously graduating. I uh, had a academic scholarship through uh, the St. Francis of Assisi's Society. And, um, and so I, I did that. And I joined the Air Force, went to security forces. Uh, I got lucky, right? I went through basic tech school and I had about five folks uh, with me who went through all of that. And then they were all going to Korea. They are all going to Osan. And I had Lackland Air Force Base as my first duty station. And I ran into uh, another tech schooler who wanted to stay in his hometown in Texas and was going to Osan. So I ended up swapping and uh, got to hang out with my five buddies going up to up there to Korea. And so from Korea, I went down to Kadena. Or actually, no, I went down to Bellas Air Force Station. Oh, I was boy. stationed in Air Force. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <Hard>. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Very hard duty out there. Um, I was there for four years. So Osan from 11 to 12, wow. then I was at Bell's Air Force Station from 12 to 16. Uh, that's where I met my wonderful wife, um, who is also, it's funny, she went to an all-girls school, oh, uh, Sacred Hearts. Yeah. yeah, Sacred Hearts Academy. We did not meet. We did not oh. meet while we were both in high school. So, yeah, <laughs> so is that, that a prior relationship that you rekindled when you got back to the island? So what's funny is our schools both would have school dances together because it was all boys school and all girls school, but I never, never met her. That then. So, yeah, that's kind of crazy the world. And so um, I have three kids. So while in Hawaii, I had, uh, well, my son, my uh, middle daughter, and then from Bell's Air Force Station went to Kadena when I was out of Kadena. Oh, I'm skipping bases here. I'm kidding. I went to Kunsan. Okay. So I went to Kunsan. I was doing the Korea hop right to get to the next follow on that I wanted to get to. Yeah. Um, so Kunsan for a year. My daughter was born right beforehand. So her name was uh, Anna Kalani. Such a beautiful girl. And then to Kadena. And so we relinked up back there. And that's where, I mean, Temple Security Forces, right? You do entry controller. So I'd done entry controller at Osan along with PL1 security. And then from there, 2023, October, or really August, I found out I may, I got the commandant position. And so I went to the Enlisted Professional Military Education Instructor course down in Maxwell, Alabama, around August to September. And then I've been the commandant here at Spangalum for know, seven months now, eight. And that's, and that's where I'm at. Um, I have three children. I, know, I think I said that, but I didn't say all their names. So I'm just going to say. <laughs> yeah, if they watch this, they're going to it there. Uh, I know. I have to. You know, well, obviously, my wonderful wife, Lee Howell, I have to shoot her out as well. And then, uh, and they're all here 
with me. Well, they're actually in Hawaii, so they're they're on the same island oh, okay. we're on right now. Yes, yeah, so they're they're enjoying a vacation. So I have my son Iolani, my middle daughter Anna Kalani, and my youngest uh, Lilina. And so they're all enjoying and soaking up the sun, probably right now while I'm here over here in Germany. Actually, it's a little early. Yeah, we're uh, yeah we're a little early, four thirty. But give it another two mm-hmm. hours, it's going to be another you know beautiful morning here, and I'm sure they'll. Hit one of the beautiful beaches at their mm-hmm. <laughs> at their Get that wonderful food. Um, so I know I think did I miss anything on my introduction or anything you'd like to know further? No, you crushed Quite. that. Uh, I am curious. You know, um, you're probably the first security forces person that I've met in this innovation space. I think you're. If if we've interviewed one before, it definitely escapes my mind. So I absolutely am curious where and how throughout your your career did you see some innovation i know you've talked about process improvements with your with your great mentors that is that really what ignited your flame of of even stepping foot into what we call innovation space as far as process improvements and then you know um just different making things making the air force better is really the light term or big term impact of of what we do or try to do as innovators it's it's funny right because i think about kunsan and I, I think he just gave me the tools to be an effective supervisor and to critically think. Um, one of the first instances where I felt like I had some success in, and I, I feel like a lot of people think that innovation is digital, right? That, that we have to do something digital to make yeah. this better. And in my mind, I don't think that innovation has to do, to do with digital at all, really. It's like you said, that process improvement. And while I was at Kadena, this was back in 2018. So when I was on flight, you know, patrolling and, and whatnot, I'd go out and, and we'd go to this certain area on the flight line and we do change over in this weird way. Um, it's not so small, but at the time I had brought it to my flight chief, you know, and, and people get busy and it kept falling off. And so instead of, and I, I mean, if I get in trouble for this, it is what it is, but I, I didn't ask for permission. I went and tested it. Sure. So I, I got with the off going and I said, Hey, can we try this out? Can we, can we try this different method? And at first they were a little scared to right? be a security <laughs> force. Sometimes can be very rigid and it's like, well, oh, I, I got to follow how it's going to go. But I, some, I somehow convinced them and we ended up doing it that way. Mm-hmm. And so when we did that, it cut down the change over time drastically from having to go around all over the place. Right. And then once I did that, right. With, because nobody knew we did this. I went back to my flight chief and I said, hey, because I was a staff sergeant at the time. I said, sir, you know, this doesn't make sense because of X, Y, and Z. I've, I've timed it. We saved this much time, la di da And so it got implemented, actually, surprisingly. It got implemented in about three weeks after I'd actually gone out, not asking for permission, just trying to see if it works, taking a little bit of risk and having it turn out well. And... um. And I think that was the first step towards why are we doing things the way we're doing them all the time and not trying to look at it in a different light. Now imagine the amount of time that you're saving for the 25 people on every flight that worked that post for an entire year. Where we can save on simply changing procedure slightly. And I would say that was the first, the first one for me. Um, and I've, I've never done a uh, green belt, green belt, yellow belt, any of the belts. Um, I personally, I feel like, yes, it'd be great courses to go through, maybe give you ideas on how to be innovative, maybe how to go through and follow through with processes that will stick. Um, a lot of what I've done has just been, gosh, looking at something and going, this doesn't make any sense. How can we be better about this and, and maybe be a little bit more flexible? On some things, um, I do have an instance here at Spangalum, uh, previous to the Scrum course. So this was back over at Security Forces as well. But right when I got here, because we do a lot of the the drone technology, right? So we have we were really really into that. Right now, I don't have to put this into Google to figure out where this is. Now I know exactly how far in you are or where you're at within the the boundary. Now I can call Polizei exactly the location where you're at and get them there and, and do that whole night. And so that those kinds of things are, are where I kind of stand when it comes to innovation. Um, 
fact, but I find that if anyone were to take anything from, from this interview, it would be that process improvement doesn't have to be digital and process improvement or innovation is that as long as it makes life better for someone, something, some process, some anywhere, as long as it makes something better, I find that to be process improvement and potentially innovation. Thousand. Fully agree. I, uh, honestly. <laughs> and like you mentioned too, uh, you had to take a little, a little risk, um, on your own and the other other portion of that story is not only just yes there's a little risk when you're trying to make a change and then human interaction and buy-in um, so i'm thankful in your journey that you had a team willing to give you a chance right uh, a lot of times um, and i think that's uh, probably one of the bigger deterrents to some of these process improvements is someone in a change not willing to take a risk or they're not willing to try the change for a process improvement. But for you at that level and being a staff sergeant at the time, how much empowerment did that give you to see not only was this idea that you you and your team wanted to do, but it worked. And then not only that, it was uh, accepted and implemented like full butterfly effect. If, if they say no, does your kind of innovation journey or process improvement journey kind of either or dwindle or, or soften a little bit? So I would, for this specific story, it's funny. I had brought it up previously, right? With, with no evidence of it being a better solution sure. at the time, the first time I brought it up. Um, and the flight chief at the time, I think because he didn't have data and things to go off of. And while he didn't say, hey, go and try this out, you know, and then let me know, it just kind of, uh, kind of stopped there, right? The process stopped there. So yes, did I take some risk and yes, did it work out in the right way? Absolutely. But I also knew that what I was proposing was all within, I think the left and right boundaries of, of my risk tolerance, yeah. truly. And we were all in the same area. And I knew that, shoot, if, if we get caught doing this, I know that I can articulate why I'm trying to do this. <laughs> so I, I would say, I would say, I can, to, I can write a rebuttal uh, for this. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's not, it's not like I was, I was doing something that, that wasn't for the betterment of everyone else. Right. And so if someone feels like they're getting a roadblock or feels like, well, gosh, I'm not even getting a chance, hmm. you should. And I think we're getting there with Mission Command. Right. We're, we're getting to where senior NCOs, NCOs, people need to be able to make decisions at their own levels. And this is one of those things that I felt that as a staff sergeant, I could do. And I did. <laughs> and then I compiled the data and thankfully the data convinced. And I knew enough about what I wanted to do because I obviously got posed questions on, well, why aren't we doing it like this or like that? And it's like, well, that's old information that they don't do anymore, right? It's a lot of times, a lot of people up at the higher levels don't get to see what's happening on the ground. And that's where it comes to us and our own locus of control to be able to go, I do see this on the ground and not giving up when told no the first time or the second time, or they just forgot and just letting it stop. You know, you just got to keep pushing until someone says yes, or at least gives you feedback on a better way to do it yeah. or another way to do it. So, yeah, it, it worked out, and and, and I'm thankful, and I'm thankful to the the uh, the staff sergeant, and I don't even know his name, but the staff sergeant that agreed to do it with me, because it wouldn't have happened if he hadn't allowed it either. So, with on the other flight, so it's uh, it's kind of cool. So let's move along a little bit, though, in this journey, right? So, you're no longer in the security forces career field. You're commandant mm -hmm. now at the Pitts and Barger uh, Airman Leadership School in Spangdalem. What has one? What has that tra transition um, been like? Um, obviously, mm -hmm. you had um, flight leadership experience, but you know that that's absolutely leading people in airmen, but career field specific. But now you're taking on a on a much broader professional military edu education scope with all career fields from the Air Force. Um, right. So let's talk about that transition first, and then um, we'll talk about. You know, what, what it's been like bringing some of those innovation ideas to a schoolhouse. Awesome. Uh, so the the transition was pretty seamless, to be honest. 
I <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. funny because yeah. in security forces, we, we lead a lot of people yeah. most of the time. We're in charge of a lot of people. We're charge not per se different AFSCs, but different personalities. Oh, yeah. So getting into the commandant position. So when I when I interviewed, I guess there were there were seven other folks. And I want to say this because my my hiring official, Mr. Knapp, uh, he's no longer here. He, he got a job up at Ramstein, uh, but GS-12. And he had told me, well, we already had our guy until you had walked in. And I was like, what? You know, because I guess there were some other folks that had some really good records, right? I think previous PME experience, they were without a commandant here for about seven to eight months prior to me taking over. And so they were looking that way. And I, and I came into the interview and I, and I, it's funny. I was just me. I, I was just real. I was just telling them, tell them exactly how I felt about things. And, and, and thankfully they saw something in me to hire me. And uh, it's been a ride ever since I completed my first class back in October. Haven't unfortunately been able to teach another class just yet. Just been kind of getting my feet wet with the whole commandant gig, but I would say off of that first class, I had one civilian student, and then I had everything from plumbers to air traffic controllers. And and I'm, I'm going to say this for us security forces folks, and I think a lot of them feel the same way. It's like, well, we work harder than everybody else because we're out there on the wall or at the gate, you know, on the holidays, on the weekends, everything else. And now getting into this job and actually seeing what other people are doing. We don't work the hardest. We all work <laughs> the hardest. Yeah. Everyone is working from the DFAC to security forces to Intel to, to everywhere, to every function in the Air Force and every AFSC, we're all jobbing it. And that's probably the biggest realization that I've had. Um, and, and I love it. I absolutely love it because I cannot wait to bring that mentality back to security forces and be able to speak one and maybe build relations with other career fields now that I know what they actually do. Um, no, I was just going to say, so I am curious then, you know, um, you know, your innovation journey really speaks to process improvements. You've been in your seat about seven, eight months, you said. What and and you've already spoke about hey how do I right back to that human interaction how do I how do I as a leader engage with people that have had completely different experiences careers uh, perspectives how do I lead and get you know solve problems and get their ideas to the forefront so you can get buy in from them how do what does that mean to you in the innovation type space especially in a in a schoolhouse where it might be a little more implemented and structured as far as a policy point. So what we're looking at right now, and I'm we're still working through it, is something that I really want to get into some of the counseling sessions that happen uh, within ALS, right? Usually, and I believe it happened back when I went through two, right? You have a you have a, a troop with a problem and you have to counsel that individual and work some ways around getting there. But Maxwell has this awesome live AI kind of counseling trainer in a sense so you can talk to an ai generated person and there's obviously someone behind it giving it prompts and everything else but it seemed like a much more realistic experience and that's what our uh, our developmental advisor puts on for some of the saber u classes that are here and we're trying to bring that down into als right um or at least here at spangala and maybe if it, if it works out and it's great maybe implement it across across the air force, but, um, looking at that first, because, you know, some of the problems, right. Is you have to have someone certified. You have to send them down to Maxwell, some of those things, trying to, trying to get that up and running. And, uh, you know, we have to wait on where Maxwell is at time differences and, and figuring all of that versus maybe sending one of my instructors down there to, to, uh, to get the certification and maybe be able to run it here. Um, is one of the spaces that we're looking at to improve processes here and to help the airmen be better leaders on the front lines, right? I mean, if if we've got, if your troop has an issue and you aren't taking care of them the right way and you can't have a difficult conversation to get someone help, 
or to correct an issue, that's a problem. And, and that's going to speak to how we accomplish the mission after that as well. Um, so I think that that section of it, I, I'm still working through it and we're still trying to figure it out, but that's something that I want to get into the curriculum. Maybe not Air Force wide. If the Barnes Center wants it, that's fantastic. Um, and there's nothing saying that I can't do that either though, as long as I put the prompts in that say it's from the curriculum. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, but it's also for Maxwell, and, and that's and I love I love uh, I love the Barn Center. They're really great about about being able to send a request or send things up to the policy team, and they're constantly revamping how they instruct and what needs to be changed, what works better. So I know that they are moving in a fast paced environment as well, trying to keep up. Um, now. I, I will share something that me and uh, the DA, so Master Sergeant Diaz, uh, developmental advisor, we're in the same building. So we're all in building 130 on Spangalum. Uh, maybe you shouldn't share that with everyone. Uh, come find me. But <laughs> uh, I remember Spangalum. If you're in 130, the building next to you is like 435. And then after that, it's like 721. <laughs> I think you're still good. No, fair, fair, fair. Well, good. We're going we're to go with that. But the. Um, but we ended up buying some, so using innovation funds, we bought some Surface Pros actually. But these Surface Pros, because have you heard of a desktop anywhere? I have heard of it, yeah. Yes, have you ever used it? I have not, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> me neither, me, yeah. me neither, right? I, I, I hadn't even heard about it. And then I heard about it from my the DA. Um, and so we bought these Surface Pros with a CAC that we can plug in, right? Because we're on the go all the time, all the time. And so with Desktop Anywhere and the Surface Pro, now when we go to meetings, we take our Surface Pro with us. We can CAC in right there using whatever Wi-Fi, because it doesn't matter what Wi-Fi it is. It's already a, a uh, cutoff system and uh, can do your work from literally anywhere as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, I could go to... Starbucks on the Surface Pro or, or on my personal computer and actually do it out there if I really wanted to. Um, and I was, me and him are trying to implement some of that for the students of not only ALS, but also for, for uh, Sabre University. Um, just to kind of keep up in the digital age, right? Like, why do I have to come into to my office to do this versus being able to do it essentially wherever I have an internet connection, so. Um, those are a couple, some of the couple things that we have done so far. We only bought two though. I'll say that we wanted a beta test. because I feel like that's an issue sometimes in the air force, um, is that we like to, we like to buy things thinking that they will work in bulk yeah. and then they won't work. And then we've wasted all that money versus maybe buying one or two beta testing just a little bit and then going, all right, this works. Let's go full send. Right. Um, so that's what me and Sergeant Diaz right now, we're still working through it all, um, but it seems like a good product and it seems like a good way forward, especially with uh, potential virtual classes, which I've had to do, done, do recently that you know, could have snow days in Germany, right? Recently as in a few months ago, but just being able to be flexible and having the students flexible as well. So those are some of the things that we're working on in the schoolhouse um, or in our building, because me and the DA, we are lock and step, uh, the professional development center. So. Yeah. Sounds. Uh, CYC, if you're listening, you had mentioned something about the schoolhouse that impressed you. You can cut yourself out, but what was it that stood out? I don't know if he's listening. Right. There he is, yay. Yeah, the, the museum. Mm. All built by, by airman for airman is truly impressive. So I can I would say, I would say in EPB style, a true testament of what airman can achieve right there. So I can, uh, I believe, I don't know how good the video is. It's still very fuzzy. Uh, it looks, it's looking good right now. And this is the Heritage Hall over at Spigalm Air Base, uh, Pitts and Barger Airman Leadership School. So we have all types of memorabilia, including these Disney patches, to every flight that we've had or every class that we've had attend ALS. They all do a different type of tile and we replace the ceiling. Uh, so as you can see here, 
a lot of World War II memorabilia um, from everything from the candy bomber at the top here to a piece of the Berlin Wall. And as we move on, we have a section for the Korean War and then to Vietnam and, and William H. Pitsenbarger's uh, memorabilia uh, with the original Air Force Cross donated by his family along with with the original citations to include his original uniform. Um, this is something that the schoolhouse has kept running for a few years now of, of one, maintaining everything and two, adding new pieces where we can. Um, so here we have some of our special forces airmen who have, who have died in action along up to Operation Secret Squirrel and Operation Desert Storm. And a lot 9/11 memorial and a lot of these like this piece here was a class legacy gift I mean the students had created this not only the towers but also the painting behind the towers some more legacy gifts here other donations flight suits and even drawings like these we also have a corner for breaking the glass barrier for all of our, our female, our U.S. Air Force female accomplishments, and to include the Tuskegee Airmen. And lastly, we have our Medal of Honor recipients up on the wall. Along with some other memorials, one for Senior Airman Larry DeFrancesco, and A1C Nate McDavitt. And concluding with the Cobar Towers. And then from there, that's our Heritage Hall. We also have this, just as different berets, different types of gear across different AFSCs and services. But into the Chiefs room. Here we have all of the SIMSAS of the Air Force. And stopping here on Chief Gaylor's original uniform, his original blues that he donated to Pitts and Barger Air Leadership School. And of course, in his fashion, certified it on a DFAC napkin across the street. Well, thanks for joining me on a tour of our, our Yusefi Hall. Bye. Uh, were we able to see everything? Yeah, we got all of it. That thing, that, the muse, it looks great. And um, thanks for walking us through and giving us the, the backstory on that stuff. That was really cool. What type, I mean, we don't have that type of stuff in every schoolhouse in the force. Have you seen... Mm -hmm. Uh, some neat reactions from airmen that haven't seen uh, our heritage or, or some of the things that the, as a force have done, you know, that's, it's just, you know, as a force, we don't do, we don't do a good enough job uh, at all ex uh, expressing our history or, or prioritizing or embracing and celebrating it. So uh, I thought that was cool to see that. And I was just curious, you know, what type of reaction have you seen uh, as you get new students that come in and walk through there? Oh, um, obviously proud, right? That proud reaction that, hey, I, I am connected to something bigger than myself. And hey, there have actually been people who have uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice toward this cause or towards that cause or for the Air Force, for their country. And I think a lot of that sometimes is lost now. Um and yes, yes, we're in the great power competition. Yes, we have some things on the horizon. Um, but I think it's always great to be able to look at the past and maybe get a little bit more reinvigorated about why you joined. And I feel like that's the piece that hits a lot of the students a lot more is, wow, okay, this really puts this in perspective. And 
I either one, my why is strong enough or two, I might need to think about the why I'm here. Um, I would say those are the reactions that I see um, and off a conversation with some of the students, right? Whether connection. So one of my, uh, one of my instructors, Sergeant Rivera had a student whose grandfather was a Tuskegee Airman and pointed him out on the, uh, on the picture frame and, you know, those connections, right? The connection, that legacy, the profession of arms, like it's just, it's heartwarming to see some of those things continuing on. And I think that this museum helps to, to reinforce that idea, right? Because at some, in some point, right? In some way, shape or form, we will all be a part of some type of operation that is then on a museum wall yeah. in the next hundred years right, or 50 years or whatever the case. And, um, and I think with the reactions, it's how do I leave my own mark somewhere in history? Yeah. So that's a we. Tough. I love. I absolutely love this thing. Go ahead. No, that, I was just going to add like that that story with your airman pointing at the wall. What a powerful story, especially in that location. Incredible. Right. It's it's the connection. The connection, the connection you'd never think would happen, right? Smaller force, and I guess small, I guess, uh, cross generations. But um, I absolutely love that hall. Um, we have the students all, some of those things that you saw in there were gifts. A lot of them are gifts. Um, we had actually the first commandant to come, or the first commandant of Pitsa Barger Emerald Leadership School visit us a couple weeks ago, back when... So he was back there when it was a flight chief. It wasn't the term commandant. So he was a sure. flight chief of the NCO prep course out at Bitburg Annex. And then while he was there, they kind of changed the duty title to commandant because of the, uh, the command level decisions of, of removing a student from the course, right? Without, with uh, without anyone being able to trump that decision, without any discussions with the command, right? The commander of that student couldn't stop the process, which is why it's commandant because of that command level decision. And talking to Chief Sullivan, so he's retri retired Chief uh, Mike Sullivan. So he used to be the uh, US Space Command Command Chief, uh, probably, I wanna say it was what, 10 to 15 years ago or so. Uh, but obviously he was the Pitsenbarger commandant a long time ago. And he is the reason why we have a lot of these pieces in this museum. Um, I won't dive in to how he acquired some of these things, <laughs> but <laughs> right. Right. But I will say, I will say that he, he is one of the many reasons why we have a lot of these pieces. And when he was here, he was still pointing at pieces that he had found back when he was a part of this schoolhouse, uh, to probably 20 some odd years ago. Um, and it is just fantastic to see, right? Uh, to one, meet the first commandant, truly. And then two, to see what he brought to the schoolhouse and what his mentality was on, on leaving a legacy and leaving, leaving something for people to look at and go, that's why I'm here. That's awesome. So, yeah. All right, so more. I ask this as a close to every guest that we chat with. Um, in your innovation toolbox, you get to travel in time to younger you and give yourself either a piece of wisdom or a tool to carry with you along the way. What do you give yourself and why? Hmm. I go back. A big stick. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, and this is going to sound cliche, but it's okay. My piece, my piece of advice would be to really dig into whatever you're trying to change. Like, don't do it. I don't want to say half-assed, but don't do it half-cocked, right? Don't do anything half-cocked. If you're going to try to change something, if you're going to try and do something better, then you need to be all in. There is no, there is no time for to be hesitant. There is no time for doubt. It's you do this and you do it fully, I guess would be my advice to myself and to any other innovator is that you're going to be told no 
right? You're going to be told a lot of times and you just need to believe in yourself and follow through. I would say that's my advice and why. <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, for hanging out with us on your evening now over in Germany. Uh, so uh, again, I'm glad that we uh, got to work this out and, and uh, I really love this conversation. So thanks for hanging out with us today. No, thank you for having me. Um, and, and thank you for highlighting folks in the field. This is the first time I've ever heard of something like this. And I wanted to say thank you to the Tesseract team, especially uh, CYC. Uh, John, uh, wonderful putting me in contact with you and, and kind of setting this whole thing up too. Um, we're still working on a lot of the BYOA projects from the Scrum course that we went through. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we see some things come to fruition soon. But uh, sweet. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Any references to trademarked, copyrighted, or protected products or services such as books, movies, or businesses are used here for the limited purpose of education and professional development of Air Force Airmen. If you have any questions, please contact us at www.tesseract.af.mil.